Yeah, welcome back. You know, Mika, leading up to uh, the September 15th, 2008 bust on Wall Street and the Great Recession, um, I kept reading about credit default swaps in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, other papers, and kept trying to figure out exactly. It didn't make sense. It was right. one of those things I would stop. I would go back and read the paragraph again. I go, wait a second, what's this? They yeah. chop up bad debt. They spread it. I couldn't figure out how it worked, but... I just assumed at the time, okay, well, there are people a lot smarter than me. Someone knows what they're that doing. It figu that's figured this out. And I guess the SEC was thinking the same thing. <laughs> it ended up uh, they weren't smarter than us. They, they damn near destroyed our economy. And here we find ourselves 13 years later in a similar position with big tech. Yeah. I mean, they, they, they seem to be escaping uh, time and time again, uh, meaningful government oversight, and the consequences could be great. Yeah, I, I, a new study on the behavior of Facebook users seems to confirm something many of us already knew. The Washington Post reports on a forthcoming peer-reviewed study showing that from August of 2020 to January of 2021, news publishers known for putting out misinformation got six times the amount of likes, shares, and interactions on Facebook than trustworthy news sources did. In response, Facebook said the report measured the number of people who engaged with content, but not those who actually view it, which is something Facebook did not make publicly available to researchers. Joining us now philosopher and professor at Stanford University, Rob Reich. Also with us, computer scientist who worked at Google when it was merely a startup. Uh, we have uh, Marin Sahami. He's also a professor at Stanford. And also former key staffer in the Obama White House and political uh, science professor at Stanford, Jeremy Weinstein, and the three are co-authors of the new book out today, System Error, Where Big Tech Went Wrong and How We Can Reboot. So, Rob, let's start with you. Uh, how can we reboot? Just like the big banks, the big Wall Street banks escaped uh, the SEC and, and government regulation effectively because $80,000 lawyers couldn't compete with multi-million dollar lawyers. Uh, how do we uh, not stay one step ahead of big tech. How do we catch up to big tech? Yeah, the, the key is first understanding what the problem is. You can't decide how to act or react or contain the problems with big tech that, that's acquired this big grab over our lives unless we figure out the problem first. And the problem, we think, has to do with the ways in which all of these important decisions that big tech has made about how our lives go, about the information ecosystem, about our privacy, um, these are being made by a small number of people and a small number of companies, most of them located right here where we are in Silicon Valley. And the reboot that we think is so essential has to do with all of us as individuals raising our own agency, our own voices, as well as doing so collectively to bring Washington, D.C. into the picture. And, and Mehran, talk about the technology. It moves so quickly uh, and, and uh, again, such cutting edge. How, how do we keep up with that technology uh, to understand where it's going, where it's moving, the impact it's going to have on our society? That's a great question, Joe. And there's lots of things we can already see right now about the impact of that technology. So sometimes people would cast this decision as, you know, you can choose which apps you want to actually work with. And that's the only choice you have. You can either delete Facebook or you use it. But in actuality, we actually have a lot of personal controls over the technology that we use. We can say, for example, set privacy settings on an application. We can choose, you know, to use particular browsers that may have more privacy built into them than others. But at the end of the day, the real issue here isn't just about personal choice, it's about collective action. And maybe one way to think about that is the roadway system, right? So on the roadway system, it's not enough to just say, you should drive safely. What we do is we have a bunch of safeguards mm -hmm. in place. We have things like lanes, we have traffic lights, we have speed bumps that help provide safety in the entire system. And then individuals work within that system to also drive safely. We need the same thing in terms of tech regulation. We need 
tech regulation around things like content moderation and the large platforms. We need uh, algorithmic transparency to understand when high risk decisions are being made for individuals by algorithms and give them a chance to actually have due process and accountability in those systems. And we need to think about AI coming that's actually going to have impact on a lot of jobs and what kind of policies we want to have around reskilling to blunt some of the impacts of people becoming unemployed. Yeah, and, and, and Jeremy, it, it is hard to follow the latest technological advances. It's not very difficult, though, to look at the impact it's having on not only American democracy, but Western democracies, democracies across the globe, and also just just the the callousness. That uh, I'll just use an example of Facebook in 2016. Sheryl Sandberg screaming. Uh, at, at somebody who went to the board and told them the truth about Russian disinformation that was infecting Facebook globally. So I think this is a moment for all of us to wake up and pay attention. It, it's 100 percent clear that while technology has provided enormous benefits that are changing how we work and how we live, the social harms can no longer be ignored, whether it's the misinformation and disinformation that you described, the impacts on our workforce of automation, the erosion of our privacy. These are effects that all of us now live with. And I think the real challenge for us is to figure out what does it mean to energize our democracy to engage in helping us hold to account the powerful tech companies that are making decisions that are yielding these effects on our lives. And ultimately, that's a challenge for democracy. It requires all of us to inform ourselves, to discuss with our colleagues, with our peers, with people in our community, but also to look to Washington, which has really enabled this process of concentration of power in a small number of tech companies. And so that we need to be in a position where we're holding politicians accountable for yeah. the outcomes that we want from technology. Well, I guess we, uh, Rob, will go back to where we began and ask why, then why has nothing been done? Why can't we hold big tech accountable to an extent to, to the point that we can understand, and I know this is all fast moving and it's far more complicated, but can't we hold them accountable like publishers? Not in the same way as publishers. I mean, the, the tech industry would have you believe that whatever problems there, there are, they're working hard on them, they're, they're sorry for, for mm -hmm. whatever problems have been made, and they often like to speak about the unintended consequences. And I, I find that phrase, we find that phrase kind of peculiar. It's as if you know, we've just been talking about Afghanistan. It's as if the withdrawal that happened was just a, an unintended consequence. We didn't mean for it to happen this way, and therefore people should get a free pass about it. Um, Silicon Valley seems to think that if you're not intending to create a harm, then you shouldn't be held accountable for the harm. And with respect to content moderation or things that we see online in our, in our news feeds, um, there's a complicated story to tell there about the First Amendment, but, but fundamental to the, the basic idea is that at the moment with Facebook, there's exactly one person who's making all of the decisions about content moderation for a community of approximately 3 billion people, and that's Mark Zuckerberg. He's a, a kind of unaccountable king or dictator of an entire information ecosystem for that number of people. That's simply unacceptable in a, in a place where the effects of that platform are so large. The book Amen. is System Error, Where Big Tech Went Wrong and How We Can Reboot. Stanford University professors Rob Reich, Marin Sahami, and Jeremy Weinstein, thank you all very much. Thank you uh, all. For the book. Such, such important work. We're it's so grateful on. that you did it. Uh, please come back. Hey, thanks so much for watching our YouTube channel. You can follow up on today's top stories and breaking news or catch up on your favorite MSNBC shows all in one place. Download the NBC News app today.